I've been in dogs since 1991. We breed dogs that we want to train. I was out here in Western Nebraska riding Harleys and training dogs. Now you don't sugarcoat anything, and if you don't like it, tough. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Flatliner Kennels with Chris Jobman. I am Elliot, the co-host here, and I am with the one and only Chris Jobman. We're going to do another Q&A today. Are you all ready? Well, let's go. Hi, yes, everybody. We're going to jump right into it. So we were talking I off there about- I got one what? thing. I got to get something off my chest. I love the questions. I love the interaction, but please, everybody, give us more detail. I need- when we're trying to answer these questions, I need like really like detailed what's the problem, the exact thing, or maybe a, a, a video on it or a diagram. The more information that we can have on a, like a problem of your dog, the better off I can answer it. Some of this stuff is really vague, and I and I don't know exactly what 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 you're asking. So, more detail the better. Please, and you can you can submit videos or upload videos over there on the Facebook group. And yeah. That would be probably the most helpful, but the videos would and be, diagrams. And you never know if you do that, your video might make it into a YouTube short. You never know. That would be nice. You never so know. Come on over to the Flatlander Kennels Facebook group, join up, submit your questions. Yep. Listening to us talk is like, it's like two brothers arguing about the dumbest stuff ever. <laughs> Ever. Don't get, don't get, let's not get into the teal thing. I, I love teal. <laughs> you have no idea how much I love blue wing teal, honestly. It's <laughs> like, you think you know how much I love them? You don't know how much I love right. them. <laughs> it's too hot. There's mosquitoes. It's 95 degrees. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I love them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's jump right into the first question here. We've got Alan Jackson, ways to improve a dog's casting with angles in water. First cast on a blind dog always wants to dig back instead of take the cast for an angle change of directions. Yes, Georgie does this too. I can't wait for this answer. Don't, don't. So if, if, if the dog always gives you a cast refusal on the first one, right? So what? there's nothing wrong with, with blowing the whistle, dog turns around, treading water. There's nothing wrong with giving her a correction with before you even make your first cast. So you blow the whistle, give her a correction like, hey, listen to me. Don't just dig back because you're excited. Listen to me. Give her a correction, cast. Don't let her give her, don't let her give you that first cast refusal. Right? If, mm -hmm. if it happens all the time, then you need to blow the whistle. Because what they're doing is they're so excited that they don't even you blow the whistle and you're almost like a nuisance. Like, what? What do you want? You cast them, they just they go back to where they were going to go in the first place. So blow the whistle, give them a correction, like listen to me, cast, and then that will become a habit where they they blow, turn around. They're like, oh, here we go. He's going to give me a correction. Oh, he didn't give. Me, and they start taking the cast because they're waiting for the correction. See what I'm trying to say? Oh, that I'm so glad he asked that. Mine is more on land, but it, that's exactly the, the same procedure. thing. Do the same thing. I give her a especially on left back angle, even with a step, she'll kind of take the right. Her first two steps is the, what I want. And then she's okay. going straight back again. I stop her, yep. bring her back, nick her. And then she does actually, she overcompensate. So, on so the don't next let step. her do that in the first time. Stop right. her, give her a yeah. correction. Like, Hey, listen to me. You're, you're running. You're just running. Listen to me. Give her mm -hmm. correction cast. And then eventually, oh, wow. eventually that first whistle you give her, she'll be like, Oh shit. You know, and then they take it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the water. Same thing. Yeah. Because you're breaking, I, I, that, you're breaking that mind of like, yeah. and you, you stop it. You, you're breaking that instantly. You're, you're stopping that mode of thought. Yeah. You're like, listen to me. Just quit running or swimming. Those, right? those high-powered dogs want to run, don't they? They do. They do. And you have to stop them. Like, you just have to impose your will on them. Like, listen to mm. me. Before you even move, give them a correction. And you're yeah. like, you get their attention. They're like, oh, okay, we're good. All right. I'm going to implement that immediately. Cause that's one of the, if I say what, what things do I need to work with Georgie on? And one is when I'm, when I'm lining her up, 
the angles in which I can move her. If I'm thinking about a clock, like she's really good at 12 and two, like I can direct her, but I can't get to one o'clock. You see what I'm saying? It's like yeah. the, the areas in which I can move her. It's like, I can move her 12, two, four, six, but I, I need to, it needs to be more finite. And then yep. that back left angle, she just always goes straight back on the first. So it's when you do that, is she squared up to you or how is she sitting? Yeah, she's squared up. Okay. Then, then, then yeah, she's looking at you and you give that cast. She just turns and goes where she wants to go. Like I'm mm-hmm. just going fast this way. So then yeah. stop her. Like I said, have her look at you, give her a correction, like listen to me and then cast her. Eventually yeah. that turns into that turn. Eventually when you give her that first whistle, she's going to be expecting a correction and she's going to give you that the, the right cast. Yeah. Cause what ends up happening sometimes is if I want, I'm trying to get like a, let's say a one o'clock cast. Sometimes I'll give her like a two or three o'clock cast just to get her to the one o'clock cast. So I'm adjusting yes. myself. And so then you if need I want to hold her to a cast, higher standard. You? Yeah. You need to hold her to a higher standard. She's going to be a master dog. God forbid teal season opens up, but she's going to be a master dog. And, and you need to hold her to that literal casting. Yeah. If you ask for a two o'clock cast, you better give me a two o'clock cast. Yeah. And if you don't, I'll stop you. Correction. You're going to get and recast at two o'clock. You have to hold your standard as a trainer and your expectation has to get higher. Mm. Don't give her a, th- a three o'clock to get a one o'clock. Give her a one o'clock to get a one o'clock. And you hold her. You're going to take a one o'clock until you take a one o'clock. I mean, see what I'm saying? You you, mm-hmm. you just, you don't give her, don't give her the, the out. Give her the three o'clock to get a two o'clock. If you want a two o'clock, get a two o'clock. And you keep, and if she doesn't give you a two o'clock, you stop her, you recall her, correction. To give her two o'clock. Stop her, recall her, give her two, until she takes two o'clock. Do Hold that literal cast all day long, every day. Go going back to like well, now everybody what? not to interrupt you. Now everybody, this is a master level dog we're talking about. I'm not talking about a transition dog. Transition dog, you just want change of direction. When you start talking advanced dogs, literal casting comes into play where you expect a two o'clock, you expect a one o'clock, right? That's literal casting on an advanced dog, not a transition dog. Right. So, so, so Freddie calls this crow's feet is what I've, is what I've been using where, you know, you've got, you've got dummies set up and at the tip of three points and then a middle point. So essentially yep. you're bringing it to the middle point and then angle casting. Am I better off to do a lot of that type of drill now, work or just so that's probably for a transition dog. Okay. Not a master dog. I just need a to master to do a dog, the, only when way, the only way you get good at, at, at an advanced dog, the only way you get good at literal casting, and the only way you get good at casting in general and cold blinds is to run cold blinds and to hold to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you get good at it. Because in a drill form, she's going to kill it. And, right. and you're doing nothing. You're doing no good besides exercising her. Yes. Because it's yeah. a drill. In, in a real life situation, a cold blind, you have to run cold blinds. You have to give literal casting and you have to hold them to the standard of their literal casting. Now, you've been out here and watch me run all my dogs. My dogs are very, very literal. Yeah. I don't do drills. I don't do drills with any of them. We run cold blinds and we hold a really high, on our, our advanced dogs, we hold a really high literal casting standard. We don't run drills. We don't, I don't ever run a drill. So, so what's probably has happened is if I, if I want to a two o'clock cast and she gives me a one o'clock. She's kind of going in that area and I'm letting her do it. Yeah. That's yeah. You're letting her do it. Your, your standard needs to come up. Yeah. Is what you need to do. And she's just learned that. Okay. Yep. Which really ties yeah. back into what Eric's like. He's like, you let that dog kind of run the show. Is, yeah. Is exactly. the, all right. Good yeah. stuff. Uh, teal season come. You don't have to worry about it. Well, I don't mean to make all this about me, but this is pretty much about me. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right next year you're so travis i don't know how to pronounce this e-i-d-e how would you pronounce that last name travis e i d i i don't know i anyway if you i don't know what no clue if you were a one dog trainer with no access to dead ducks how would you overcome dog number 66 from hanging up in the drag back of previous 65 flyer ducks on a hunt test 
on mark number three flyer at 150 yards. Travis, you have access to ducks. You just said you read a hunt test. Your dog 66. Ask the hunt test to, hey, can I buy a couple of dead ducks? You have access to ducks. The, it, there, anybody can have access to ducks. If you were at a hunt test, and after the hunt test, if you walked up to them and said, hey, guys, can I buy five ducks, dead ducks? They would sell you five or give them to you. You you have access to ducks. Um, but drag the only way you can get good at drag back and the dog to deal with drag back is to train with ducks. That's it. There, there's no other way around it. The only way to get good at dealing with drag back is to deal with drag back. And, or, and go, go to a group, train with a group that are throwing birds and you run the last dog of the group and there's some drag back in there then, right? You have to train with ducks to deal with drag back. So, and you should be able to find ducks on Facebook marketplace. They're, they're oh yeah. They're, they're around. I mean, they're around. You just you got to look around and, and you got to be creative. I mean, I guarantee you, you can get dead ducks from a hunt desk and you need to train a group that is throwing ducks, not bumpers, because there's really no such thing as bumper drag back. So you need to throw birds and then, that way you guys can work on drag back as, as a group. All right. Dan Jurgens, if you are an I know amateur... Dan. He came out here for three days. Did you know that? Where's he from? Ooh, with, yeah, with Michigan somewhere. Wisconsin, oh, I think. He drove so, all the way out here. He called me up, texted me, hey, can I come out and train? Yep, absolutely. And he'd come out here. He drove all the way out here, showed up, and he trained, trained with us for three days. Dan's a, Dan's awesome. a good dude. Yeah, he's awesome. fun. That's cool. You know, when I was up there, there was several, there was multiple people in and out. It's so much fun. It was so much fun for me to see other people out there training, get to know them a little bit, talk to them, see their nervousness yeah. that I experienced as well. It's a re it's our kennel is a revolving door. I mean, there's people yeah. that are like, who are you? I mean, they're literally, oh, you said I could come out and train. Like, when? I mean, it just it's <laughs> people are just showing it, it's anyway. <laughs> it's chaos. <laughs> it's chaos. Yeah, it's fun. Controlled chaos. Organized mm, control. Fun. Chaos. Fun. Mm. All right. If you're an amateur training one dog, would you set one day for marks with a concept, another day dedicated just to blinds, another doing multiple marks with a few blinds and varying concepts daily to the dog's needs? Or would you set up an advanced setup, including all of the above during each training session? All this assumes the basic foundation is solid in your dog and your dog is advanced. I think you should do it all. And what I mean by that is, is we don't always run blinds in our marks. Some days we'll just run five marks. Some days we'll just run blinds. Some days we do a big advanced setup with marks and blinds. So I think you should do it all. I really do. I don't think you should run blinds in your marks all the time. I mean, if you're having troubles with some casting of a dog, casting, getting away from you should just run blinds. Um, I think you should do it all. I honestly do. I really think you should break it down. Some days you just run marks. Some days you just run blinds. And some days you combine them. I really, I think you should do all of it. Especially all the right. marking. I have to run just marks. Like you're doing like an ABCD drill and you're just running marks that day. That's all you're doing. You're not running blinds. You're just running marks. So... I think this one was answered already, but Anthony Mills drills or training to prevent scalloping and dig backs on water blinds. And let's just assume that this is an advanced. Well, answer this question as if it's like a season level dog and answer this question as if it's an advanced level dog. Um, answer it as a season and an advanced. Yeah. So like, the advanced level dog, we answered you, you up use there. the phrase transitional. Walter Brown. We are, we not Walter. Who, who, who did that? Who had the, um, Alan Jackson. We Alan Jackson's question. We we already just an advanced dog. Stop him. Correct him. So, um, drills on to prevent scalloping on digging back. There is no there is no drills. Um, scalloping or digging back on a, on an angle cast is a cast refusal. There's really and if you're it must be an advanced type of dog because we're running cold blinds, right? And and mm -hmm. they want drills. We don't do drills when it comes to that. So as long as you've gone through your water pattern blinds and you've done all your pattern blind work, your water pattern blinds, the dog knows what an angle it cast is. They, they, they know they get in and out of the water. They know all that thing, all that stuff. We don't do drills anymore. 
we run lots of blinds and we hold a really high standard on casting. We expect if we give you a 45, you better take a 45. That, that's just, you have to hold that standard and you, and you can use by attrition. You can do indirect pressure. You can do attrition and indirect pressure to, to keep that standard, but you have to hold that standard. There's really no drill because the advanced dog, like we talked about earlier, you set up a drill, they're, they're going to kill it. They're, they're going to, like pattern blinds, they're going to kill it. So you just got to run cold blinds, keep a really high um, casting standard, and hold that standard, right? And and, or, and if you have a lot of, pat, if you're, you're having a lot of um, cast refusals, keep your blinds shorter. So let's just say you're, you're running a lot of 100 to 150 yard water blinds. And you're getting a lot of cash refusals and your dog is starting to lose a ton of confidence in, in, in all that. They don't even want to look over the water. Cut them back to a 50 yard water blind so that your dog only takes one or two casts and then is and one or two good casts and is successful. Keep doing, and then that builds confidence. Oh, he knows where he, yeah, if I go this way, I get the bird. If I go this way, so they have confidence. Don't, don't start hammering out 200 yard water blinds and, and losing confidence. So start short. Get some really good casts in there where the dog is successful quickly. Do you sense. ever use do drills like wagon wheel or no? No. So, so that's just not part of your flow chart at all, that type of stuff. Oh no, it is. I don't do it. With my with my master and grand dogs, we don't do it anymore. We, I, as I, I can't far as the dog's that. progression in general. When Correct. when is that, in when our, is that in our, yes, Andrew, Andrew and Dan will the, yes, one hundred percent. That is in our flow chart to do. I don't, once these dogs are, you know, grand level, master level dogs, I don't go back to wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. I just, we run, we just train and we don't do, go back to drills. When, drills when do you do over. drills like that? Though? What stage? Cause I know in the flow chart on the, we've never actually talked about drills like that. When it's would those coming. come? It's coming. Okay. It's after swim by. It's after swim by. Swim by to me. And we'll talk about it, is the last basic. It, that it basics people who oh, my mm. dog knows the basics is force fetch. That's not even close. The last part of basics is swim by. Mm. Then you get into wagon wheel pattern blind stuff like that. That's transition. So we'll get into that down the flow chart, but yeah, it, yeah. It, we do all that. All right. You're going to like this one. Chris Tracy. What is grant hatches parts bill up to at this point at flatliner kennels? It was almost really, really high. Because for some reason, he was driving my John Deere tractor, which you know, everybody knows John Deere tractors are like really inexpensive and super cheap. So <laughs> he's driving my John Deere tractor and it stops. And I'm looking out the, my window, I'm like, well, and Grant's walking. And if, if Grant is actually walking anywhere, there's problems, right? So he's walking, Carl's walking up to the kennel. My John Deere tractor is, I'm like, what? It got hot. I'm like, Ugh. he. <laughs> He got my he over oh, he it got so hot it stopped it died like there's like flashing lights it's getting hot he didn't he didn't blow out the radiator anyway it survived miraculously survived he bought bought a new engine for a John Deere tractor so <laughs> uh, and never mind there's so many things that he has anyway Grant's a good dude yeah thanks Chris. <laughs> it just I, 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 the stories are endless today today grant carl actually come up to me today and says this week i am not breaking anything that was that came out of his mouth i'm like it's monday goes, this week i'm not breaking anything i said that's a that's mm, it's monday that's a great thought <laughs> I can't. I can't wait oh, to get Grant. back out there. I miss, I miss Grant. I miss hanging out. With him. Hungry, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> July, Grant. I can't wait to see yeah. you. Well, you may have not make someone out there that's nice to you. <laughs> nice to him. <laughs> I mean, what, what more? What more you want? <laughs> nice enough to pay the bills. <laughs> All right. Dennis Long, how do you address when a dog starts ping ponging on a blind? Does it change if it's in water or land? So ping ponging, the dog has reached its 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 length level. Like if if it's you know some dogs 
when they get to 100 yards, they start ping pong. Some dogs is 150, some dogs is 200. What does that mean? Plus, what does that mean exactly? Ping pong is, is when they will not go back anymore. They go right, left, right, left. They, oh, they okay. won't go back. They, they've reached mm-hmm. their their limit of length. So, and mm-hmm. length is all relative. You know, field trial dogs, you know, big, long length. Anyway, it's all relative. So, a lot of times what I do when a dog starts ping-ponging and goes back and forth, back and forth, and won't go back anymore, I just close the distance. Mm-hmm. So, I walk all the way up, and if I have to, I get right in front of them. I give them maybe a collar correction and a verbal back, and then that, that gets them out of that ping-pong. And eventually, if you do that enough times, it will the, they, that distance gets eroded. And, I, and my ping-ponging dogs, I like to run a lot longer blinds. Like, you just kick them off. And maybe it's a two or three hundred yard blind. Just kick them off, and you know they're going to ping pong at one hundred and fifty, right? They get to one hundred and fifty, they start ping ponging, and you just kick them off. You start walking out there. You just start following them, casting. Fall- and next thing you know, they've ran three hundred yards. They don't even know it. So you just you start lengthening the length of the blinds, and eventually all that ping ponging goes away. And it's the same on water, and it's the same on land. Now on water, you can't walk out two of them, right? So, but if they if they started their ping ponging on land and then it's moved to water, the, the when you walk up to them on land, if you sit them down, you give them a collar correction and you give them a verbal back, that gets them out of a ping pong, right? That's sh- that same correction should work on water if it worked on land. So you would stop them, give them a you know a collar correction and give them a verbal back. That should get them to drive back. If, if you've taught them on land how to get out of a ping pong. And it's just, it's just fairly, literally land. fairly common problem for dogs. It, it, is, it is. And there's some dogs, I'll tell you what, they hit a, they hit a wall. They're like, I'm not going back any farther. And you see that a lot of times in the transition dogs, the seasoned dogs, the senior dogs, they get to a certain level and they're like, and I'm, I've gone far enough. So that's why we run out here. We run a lot of long blinds because mm-hmm. we very seldom have any dogs that ping pong back and forth in the spot. They just literally just know how to run. They just want to run. So that's a yeah, good question. The, the first blind I ran out there with you guys was a little keyhole between cattails into that pond. And Georgie did that same thing. She just was, yep. she hit her limit and she was done. And yep. that's yep. exactly what you told me to do in that situation. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. Jeff Miller. What changes do you make if any in training when outside temps get hot? Well, today I um, recorded a podcast. <laughs> we we a podcast. it was 102 today and we our entire kennel was done training by one o'clock we were done we got on we got after it got, got up and got going i ran 22 dogs on a marking setup and was a blind and we shut it down it's too hot we got all of our dogs trained and we shut it down at one o'clock the guys cleaned the kennel they put stuff away and we we're done i mean because there's no sense in in in, in trying to kill a damn dog it, it, it's it's too hot and and you don't think it's that hot until it, 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 dogs, when they get in trouble, especially in high humidity areas, they can't cool down and you're in trouble and you don't even know it. It's, it's over. So, yeah. So, yeah, Jeff, in a really hot conditions, we don't train. Um, we were going to do some water work today, but Carl sprayed all the cattails. So we couldn't use the water. So we just did land and we did a really fast setup, got in and got out. You know, everybody is fine. Can you talk real quick to signs that you would want to look for in your dog if maybe your dog is in problems? With I you? mean, the, the, well, what happens is their tongue starts hanging out and it gets really long, really fat. They, they, they're they literally like almost hyperventilating. They, they can't get enough air. You know, their tongue gets real heavy and long because trying to cool down. Uh, mm-hmm. They start getting glossy eyed. Um, they don't like they're almost that like drunk. So, so to speak, they mm-hmm. start stumbling around, can barely keep their, their legs up. I mean, their back end goes out. I mean, when that starts happening, you're in deep, 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 deep trouble. Um, get them in the water, get them cooled down. Whatever you do, don't put them in the water and then put them in a curl. They will literally bake. Like, they, they need to be outside in the shade with some wind blowing on them. They, you can't. Once the dog starts overheating, the worst thing you can do is put water on them and put them in a box. It makes them hotter. It's like a, it's like a sauna. So mm-hmm. they've got, and you got to keep, get them up, keep them moving, keep them moving, get some air on them. So yeah, once they, they're, the dog is panting uncontrollably 
and then holding their mouth wide open and that you're, you need to stop. You should have stopped probably a long time before that. All right. So. Chad Verlanik, how to combat bugging on the line when lining up for blinds. This is a two year old golden. Yeah. You know, so this dog is, is bugging is looking left, looking right, looking left, looking right, looking right. So what has the dog done? Has the dog done proper wagging wheel? Has he done proper pattern blinds? What is, what has the dog, what's the background of the dog? Now, is the, is Chad trying to, like you said, hey, I want Georgie to go at one o'clock, but she won't go, once she wants to go to two o'clock. So then you try to go to one o'clock, you keep trying to go to one o'clock. Next thing you know, you're back and forth, back, they're bugging, right? And now the dog has realized the longer they bug, they, they don't have to leave. They just sit there and they just do this, like this, and then they're, they, they're winning. They're, they're training you, they don't have to leave. So what you need to do is when the dog gets relatively close to where you want them to go, if you want them to go to 12 o'clock, but they give you 11 or one, kick them off, kick them off, cast them out, deal with it. Because if you, if you're trying to get that perfect, perfect line and they start bugging, the longer they bug, they don't have to leave. So it's an avoidance. So get them close, kick them off. Eventually that bugging will go away because they'll gain confidence in you They'll gain confidence in, in, in the line, right? So just get them close, kick them off. They'll gain confidence. The bugging will go away. I promise. Is that a reaction to just feeling stressed and confused? Yes. Yes. And, or because you're trying to, you're asking a dog to go from 12 to 1. And that comes with time and experience and lots and lots of time. That doesn't happen overnight. So the, the easy, like I said, get them close, kick them off. And then they gain confidence. So, mm -hmm. when, oh, oh, right there, bam, and they take off. They, they're gaining confidence now. And then you will be eventually be able to start clicking them like you want to do with Georgie. You do, you'll be able to start doing that real clicky. I mean, you will just be able to be, barely move them and kick them off because that mm -hmm. comes with confidence. A dog that, you know, you're looking at 12 o'clock and you're then all of a sudden they're at 3 o'clock and they're not confident because they, they, they've learned to bug. So... <laughs> Get them close, Zachary, close and get them off. Zachary Eshelman, how do you decide on how many dogs to bring with you when you hunt? Is it based on the amount of hunters, hunting location? If you bring multiple, do they both need to be trained to the same level? If not, how do you know which dog to send? Is it okay to bring a dog and not send them at all? On like, I think they're worried like on a skunk hunt where the dog's not yeah. eating. Yeah, it's... Zach, Zach's a good dude. He, we, we train his Oakley dog now that's got a finish pass at like 16, 17 months old. She's got, she's running finished and doing a nice job. Um, we all, usually when we hunt in the river, we always take two dogs. And usually one dog is, is really, really, well, if, if we take two dogs, one dog has to be really experienced if the one other one's not. Because it, it's overwhelming for a really young gun dog in the river. Um, now if you're going to be hunting like in Texas where Zach lives and maybe you're in, in a frames and the dogs on the side, if, if Oakley's hunting with you and she's super steady, right. And the other dog is not, don't bring that other dog or tie the dog down because that's not fair to Oakley. Eventually you're mm -hmm. going to have two dogs breaking because it's not fair. So you need to talk to your buddies and, li and say, listen, your dog is breaking on every damn bird, and my dog isn't getting a bird at all. That's not fair. And so I won't hunt with a dog that makes the hunt miserable. I won't do it. I, I will not do it. I, I, I won't put up with it because they're loud or whatever their, whatever their problem is. You're supposed to be having fun, and that's not fun. And a dog, you know, let's say you get on a skunk hunt, who cares? The dog doesn't know you got skunked. The dog's just hanging out with you, hanging out with dad, hanging out with your buddy. They don't, they don't care. And if you want to take a bumper, throw a bumper in the water or whatever, that's fine. But they don't really care, you know. So, yeah, I, I would say if you're, if someone says to you, "I'm bringing a dog," my first question is always, "Is the dog steady?" <laughs> and if the answer is no, then the next question is, "Do you tie the dog up?" And if the answer is no, then I'm not going on the hunt with my dog and that dog. I'm no, like, no, I'm sorry, I, I won't do it. I, I won't bring do it. it. It's all right. Well, you know what? Or I'd be like, you know what? Fine, big time. Bring your dog. I'm leaving mine home. Have fun. And I'll, and I'll go on the hunt. 
and I'll watch him throw rocks and shit at the bird and watch. Get, get it, big time. Get it. I'm not bringing my dog and watching that crap. I'm not going to do it. But I will shoot birds all day long and make your life miserable if you if you insist on bringing your dog. Yeah. So. My uh, in a former marriage, I had now my dog at the time was horribly untrained, but had great drive. I mean, I didn't train at all, but my father in law <laughs> had a dog that not only was untrained, had zero instincts at hunting at all. And he would bring this chocolate lab. This chocolate lab seemed like at an IQ of about 12. And man, that thing would stumble around my dog. I mean, I would tie it up and she was a pain in the butt, but she could retrieve. This was, I was like in my early twenties. I bought a dog for like 15 bucks out of the paper, like half golden, half black. You paid more for that dog than you did Georgie. (laughs) (laughs) Boom! 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 This dog had the same level of drive as George did. <laughs> uh, it was unbelievable. But man, this dog was a pain in the ass to hunt with, man. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, man. There's some good things yeah, about I, 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 I won't do There's some bad so, things about being 21 as well. Oh, Lack yeah. The wisdom involved in a normal 21. Now, there's, uh, some, there's some 21-year-olds that are wise above their age, but your average I, race 21 year old man <laughs> i own my own house at 20 and i'm at 21 i was a nightmare oh my god it was so, so much fun you're still a nightmare <laughs> ask me i bet you would agree it, this is, this is nothing compared to, to 30 years ago that, that was bad 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 <laughs> we we've got to do that episode with eileen where it's just she and i and she gets to unload but that everyone would, wants it uh, let's do it <laughs> Do it. I ain't scared. <laughs> You're not even right. a tiny bit scared of Eileen? No, oh, I'm not scared at all. She's 115 pounds. I mean, I mean I'm way tougher than she is. <laughs> well, you're way <laughs> physically tougher than her, but from what I've seen her, I think she's got some... I don't think she's a pushover. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> all right. Next question. This is an anonymous member. Apparently, you can submit them anonymously somehow. I don't like Hello. anonymous by the way. I don't like anonymous members. Put your name on it. Put your name on there. I just wanted to it. ask for some help. I have a dog running finished who will look up at me before I send him to run a blind to get out of the work. Even with white stakes or even on a rerun of a blind, he is great handling dog, but doesn't want to look out in the field to go. Any advice? Um, Well, he's not a great handling dog because he's looking up at you trying to get out of the work. So that's part of handling is what what has caused the dog to start looking up? That's an avoidance. Is it avoidance? Probably is avoidance. What what started the avoidance problems? What what levels of training has it? See, this is what I'm talking about. Perfect example. What, right. What levels of training has the dog had? Probably forced a pile, wagon wheel, pattern blinds. I mean, what? What's making the dog look up at you? I mean, even with white stakes or even rerun a blind. So, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. So, guys, um, reminder, if if you want to really get help through these questions, put tons of information on there. Chris and I can always shorten the – condense the question. Yeah. Down, but we can't um, more, add more information we don't know. So, just give us as much detailed information – as you can to help answer these. So, well, let's just move on because there's just not enough information on that one. Too. Well, here's the thing. If a dog looks up at you for avoidance to not go on a blind, you send them on a blind. You send them. You, you don't let the dog get away with it. Like, so the dog looks up at you and let's just say this dog has been through all the steps, right? So the dog looks up at you to try to avoid the work. You send them on back. If they don't go, you nick, you heal forward, you resend. Nick, he'll for it till the dog leaves. So the dog has been properly forced to a pile, should know what that means. Right? So if the dog looks up at you, that's 100% avoidance. You don't let avoid, you You cannot let avoidance win. Avoidance is just like bugging. You can't let it happen. You can't let it win. See what I'm saying? Yep, fight it. But I don't know the level. I don't know what this dog's done. All right, Steve Kelly recently ran a finished test, land triple, Right to left, dog picks up last bird down, then middle bird. Sent for last bird on right side of the field. Dog goes bananas back to the middle mark. 
area, area of the, the fall. fall. Can't handle already used. She cracks. Tail is stat. She cracks and starts establishing a hunt. I know she's not going to get to the last bird anymore. I whistle, sat, no here to pick up. Soon as she stood from sitting, brings the duck back in. The field wasn't cleaned up from previous dog that was picked up. I didn't. I'm struggling with this one. I didn't get rerun because I know no, heard her. I no, was no, told. That being said, she shouldn't have went back to the old fall, but guaranteed she'd seen the bird. She was fighting me to the line up for the last bird. Now I know why. I'm not saying I shouldn't. I should have gotten a rerun. Go where I send you. Just a bad deal. Was that good call from the judges? This run was for a title. She was flawless on water. Ran the land blind anyway. Three whistle. I guess something to add to this is I'll be apprenticing, judging HRC and AKC this fall, and I like to have a better idea of what to do in a situation like this. I hope you understood that. You really sounded out that well. You did good. You're a teacher. Really? You're a teacher. Well, I think you – I don't know. I was struggling on that one. I, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't making Honestly, sense to me. if the dog – Goes out whether it's in the old fall. Well, if it's running AK, so let's just if it's in if it's running AKC, and you went back to an old fall, you're out automatically. If it's HRC, you're not out. You're not out automatically at all. If the dog picks up a bird in the field, in my mind, if it the dog should pass. There's a bird in the field, right? The dog should pass. The dog shouldn't even get a rerun. The dog should get a pass because it picked up a bird in the field. In my mind, but I don't know the exact, you know, what's going on there or not, but I don't want to say anything yeah. about the judge and what they, but, but I wasn't there to see the entire, you know, situation fold, unfold. So, um, but, it, but hold on. It, so on the third mark, the dog went back to the middle mark and established a hunt. Yep. So an HRC is on a switch. But even though it's already picked up, you can go back to it, an old fall. The like HRC that? is the, the only switch. The only switch in HRC is dropping a bird to pick up a diversion bird. That's the only switch in HRC. AKC, you're out. HRC, what did he mean when he said the field wasn't cleaned up from previous dog? I don't understand I, what that I, meant. There must have been birds laying in the field. So if so the dog still... picked up a bird, it should be fine. So there was a bird right? in the field when there shouldn't be. The dog picked it up and they failed him? Yeah. Because it went uh, back to an old ball. Yes. The dog shouldn't even get a rerun. The dog should pass. Okay. Because an HRC be going back to an old fall is not a switch. You're not out. And if the dog knew that there was two birds out there and ran back to the other bird, that's not the dog's fault. Because the dog knew it was there because he'd already picked yeah, up the middle mark. Because he was just there. That's anyway, weird. it sounded like a bad deal, but we weren't there. So, yeah. All right. Dan Jurgens. At what age do you start lengthening your marks and blinds, assuming you have followed all the steps and are 90% proficient? And how far do you set up in your typical training day? I start lengthening out marks when they're babies. Like if the dog is five months old and, and, and is running to the bird and not the gun, I start lengthening out their marks right away. I mean, just go. Um, blinds, same way. Um <laughs> We start lengthening out blinds as fast as we possibly can uh, within reason of, of keeping the dog not exploding because we just start taking off. Well, we, just, we just start walking like back and we just start walking. Right. So that's, you know, we do that all, we do it quickly. I mean, it happens quick. I mean, we have seasoned dogs running 250 yard blinds easily. So it happens quick. Um, how far are your setups at the typical training? I, I don't know. I, it depends on what we're doing. Depends on where we're at. You know, if we're on the east, east, east side of my big pond, it's super technical. We're probably not going to go super, super far. If we're in the big field, we'll go all the way across it. it. It all depends on where we're at, how hot it is, and what we're training for. So, let's do one more, and then we'll save a few questions in in case we need them for the next episode. Which the next episode we're going back to the flow chart, which is swim by. Is that what we're doing? Uh, I believe so. That's what you're telling me we're doing. All right. So let's do that. I've actually been curious to hear you address this one for a while now. So I'm jumping to it. Um, this is from no name. What if you send your dog to a professional trainer to put titles on him? 
you and the trainer have discussed this, but now the trainer doesn't want to run tests and says titles aren't important. What should you do? Find a different trainer. <laughs> Pull your dog. But Yeah, I mean, if you send the dog to a trainer to get titles on your dog, and now the dog, now the trainer doesn't want to run tests, you find another trainer. Very simple. I mean, if he's not going to run tests or she's not going to run tests, go to a trainer that's going to run tests, right? Is that what he's asking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's very mm -hmm. simple. Find a different trainer. Different trainer. That wants to go, find a different trainer that wants to run tests. Because that's your goal. If your goal is to run tests, find a trainer that runs tests. I would think it would be hard to find a – I guess there's different types of trainers, but trainers like the ones that – like yourself and the ones we're talking about, don't they all run hunt tests? No, not necessarily. There's gun dog trainers out there that don't run tests at all. They they're train just, gun dogs. They're just they're training. Just like, dogs. They're just training meat dogs. Yeah, gun dogs. I mean, some of them even handle, but they don't. They're not going to run tests. So, if this guy, if titles aren't important to him, but they're they're not important to the trainer, but they're important to you, they go find a trainer that the titles are important to, and yeah. switch trainers. That's all you gotta do. Are there are there trainers who also do breedings that don't run hunt tests? I guess I just assumed you would always do that because I mean, obviously, if you put titles on your dogs, they're going to be more valuable. The yeah, there's people valuable. out there that that do breedings all the time that don't have any titles. I don't care. I, I just stay away from them. Yeah, yeah. There's some of them that are so good at social media too. Uh, it's it's a it's a racket. I mean, don't even get me started on some of that stuff. So. It can be kind of fun to get you started on it, quite honestly. No, it's not. No, it's not. I get, they'll try to cancel me. I'm uncancelable. It, it, it's, don't even get me started on it. All right. Well, let's close it off there. Next week, guys, we're going to be, jump back to the flow chart. And then the episode after that is the one we're going to try to bring to you guys live. So come on over to the Facebook group where we will tell you exactly how to come and watch us record and comment, chat with each other, ask us questions. It's going to be, we're opening this up to the public. So I think that'll be a pretty fun event. So be ready for that. You got anything else, Chris? I'm, I'm good. I think, I thanks everybody for the questions. Keep them coming. So thanks everybody. See everybody at the line. Gotta strike this chord with the Let's go.